Dr. Jay Shankar is a senior assistant professor in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice, MSU, and member of Syndicate Board of Management at the Mono the Manomaniam, and I'll pronounce this wrong, so I do apologize, uh, Dr. Jayashankar, Manomaniam Sundarna University in Tamil Nadu, India. He has several publications, including articles in peer-reviewed journals such as the British Journal of Criminology. He was the Commonwealth Fellow at the Center for Criminal Justice Studies School of Law, University of Leeds, and has completed a research project on victims of cyber crimes. He is the founding publisher and editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Cyber Criminology and International Journal of Criminal Justice Sciences, and is the founding president in the South Asian Society of Criminology and Victimology, and also the founding executive director of the Center of Cyber Victim Counseling. He was a member of the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime Core Group of Experts on Identity-Related Crime. He is a member of the Membership and Advancement Committee in the World Society of Victimology, and Dr. Jayashankar pioneered the development of the new field of cyber criminology and is the proponent of the space transition theory of cyber crimes. His address this morning is cyber crime victimization, new wine into old wineskins. Please welcome Dr. Jayashankar. Thank you, Mahashini, for that nice introduction. Good morning, everyone. Until Mahashini told that it is zero degrees, I didn't understand, but I felt very cold yesterday night. It's, it's indeed cold, but it's, people are here very warm. The area of uh, the study, cybercrime victimization, is uh, something very inquisitive, very interesting and intriguing in nature. Because it is not that very having a big history. I had an interest of cybercrime for the past 10 years. I'm working in this area, but not worked in the area of victimization until one professor I met in the department while I'm having a conversation with my head of the department. He entered the department with a bank statement. Normally, if a person is having a bank statement in my university, that means he is going to go abroad because he has to submit the bank statement to the embassy or the visa processing agency. So I asked the professor, are you going abroad? And he was proudly telling, yes, I'm going to London for a conference. So I was asking that, what is the conference, sir? Uh, naturally, I'm a very inquisitive person, just uh, I casually asked him. He told, it is on race and justice. I was a little bit taken aback and surprised. I have not seen any such conference recently having such call for papers. So I asked Professor, how did you get this information about this conference? And he told me that it is by his friend that he got the information about that conference. I was having some kind of cynicism towards that conference title and the information given by him. And uh, later, I just inquired that how you are interacting. And he was telling me that he submitted the paper two days back and then he got the acceptance immediately. So that also made me something more cynical about that. And I visited his room and inquired what exactly it is. Then he told that he is fully funded for the conference except for the accommodation, which is of 500 pounds. Then I asked the professor, have you paid that 500? Then he told that I paid it and then only I came to your room. Then I checked the details of the conference and the address given by the um, conference organizer and I found in the Google map that it is an end of a street and it doesn't have any place. So I then checked the hotel and I found that the organizer or the con man, he cleverly collected the photographs of several other five-star hotels and made a collage and tried to make it as a hotel by real. So then I found the person in the hotel who is talking with the professor 
and the person who is on the other side as an organizer, both are same. But he was speaking or talking, chatting or mailing in different names. Then I casually told the professor, uh, can you please tell that due to some unforeseen circumstances that you cannot come, just ask that 500 pounds back. Then he wrote a mail that he cannot come to the conference, please give me that 500 pounds. That was the last conversation he ever had with the person and nothing came back. That was a great shock for the professor for reason that a person very knowledgeable, very elite of his nature became a victim and 500 pounds in Indian rupees at the time was something like 30,000 rupees and it is very costly for a professor. So I found that this form of victimization is something novel because it is going to attack people who are going to use the internet and I felt that there is a need for doing something on that. So that was an incident that opened the eyes, but even though I was working on the cybercrime area for a longer time. So before the spaces like land, air, and water, the victimization happened, cyberspace is something novel or unique that now people are getting victimized. Though the cyberspace has given us umpteenth number of opportunities for bringing in a lot of people closer. For example, people from India can become closer to China from US and any place. The convergence of people have happened in cyberspace. It also has brought some kind of perils in it that it also has made people go distance also. So people from far or near, people from near have become far because of the usage of the internet. And the anonymity, the nature it provides, the significant amount of people becoming victim in the cyberspace because the offender is like the Ramayana's epic, there's a person called Magnath, the son of Ravana, who will be disappearing in the clouds and he will uh, again play mischief. So like that, the offenders are there, but they are not there. The victim is only one thing, or the person is very certain. You can see that now very recently that there is a overlap of the physical and the cyberspace crimes. Slowly, those offenders who are going to the banks and looting, who are doing all kind of illegal activities, have slowly started moving towards cyberspace because it is more convenient, more easier than the earlier work. Because if he has to do a lot of work, he has to take a lot of risk if he wants to loot a bank. Now, with a minimum risk, he can get a maximum amount of money from a lot of people. So that also is one of the reasons. But whether this form of victimization is something new or it can be coupled with the existing victimization is a quandary by various professors, various scholars, and also governments are not looking into this area as a separate form of victimization. So this presentation, I would like to make it into three parts. One, first I will describe on the internet issues, then we'll come back to the cybercrime victimization issues, and we'll explain how this is a new form of victimization. First, let me dwell on the internet, historical and contemporary perspectives. I would always like to speak on the history, because history is very fascinating, and especially the history of internet is very, very fascinating. The first, in early 69, 70s, it was the American Army officials, they were working on something called as ARPANET, which is only the communication between themselves. And also the scientists or physicists, they were working among themselves uh, to communicate until the arrival of the internet and the World Wide Web in the 90s by Sir Tim Berners-Lee. So he made a graphic interface and it was open to the public. So that is the first time that the internet started getting into the hands of people the common masses and to everyone. And the development over a period from 90s to the present time, you can see something like 15 years, the growth is immense. Uh, nearly 20 years, you can see that. And the other significant Im important 
thing that happened is the arrival of social media, especially Facebook in 2004, which was casually done by a Harvard student, Mark Zuckerberg. Along with his friends, he was playing with uh, and trying to make some kind of a, uh, <coughs> interactive mode uh, session with his friends in the, in the dormitory. And then they found out the Facebook, and then that opened up, and today there is very few who are not in Facebook. These two events, one, the WWW uh, invention by Barnesley, and other, the opening of the social media, opened the internet to large masses, and that revolutionized everything. So this is, I am again giving the same kind of uh, history, but a little bit different, because here the history of social media is given. So in 1995, eBay opened the market. So e-commerce also opened. So this is something, a very uh, different kind of thing. So for example, like people uh, from South Asia, like us, we, we don't tend to do any commerce via internet, because we are touch and feel people. We want to go to the uh, shop, take that particular cloth, touch it, feel it, then only we will believe. Even in our place, they will say that don't go in the evenings to take a cloth because the shop owner may cheat you by putting lights. But now, a revolution is happening with the e-commerce situation in India. There's a company called Flipkart has revolutionized. Now, everybody is sitting in their own house and they are ordering products from Flipkart. Cell phones are coming, shoes are coming, ties are coming, everything is coming. So this is happened because of the growth of the social media, especially the e-commerce, and later on the Flipkart and that Facebook, and then Twitter. Twitter is something that also has revolutionized this particular uh, aspect because it gives an opportunity for people to air the, their opinion. Now, there's a difference you can see over a period of time that earlier people used to write diaries and they used to hide that in their bags. If somebody sees that, they'll be angry. Now, they put a Facebook status or a Twitter status and if you don't like it, they will be angry. So this is a kind of a different situation. So people would lie, now are more revealing, more open than ever. So by Jan 2015, half of the world population are on the internet. Two billion in the social media accounts and unique mobile users are three billion. And active mobile social accounts, one billion. So you can see that there is a surge of uh, the usage of internet. The penetration has happened at least for 42% of the world uh, internet access is there. But it varied from place to place. For example, in North America it is 88% penetration, whereas in South Asia you have only 19% penetration. But if you see in Australia it is 69%. So it all depends on also the the population you have, because India and also the Chinese have a larger amount of population, but still the penetration is comparatively less, but you can have an average that they are using more number of internet. And another significant aspect I would say is mobile usage. This has surged, and you can see India is in the second place of 72% of people, that India, Indian users are mobile users. Uh, if you go to India, you can find that a lot of people are standing in the mobile shops to buy mobile phones. I don't know that now the craze has come that people are getting smartphones to become more dumper than ever. So they want to use it. But how, how far they're going to use and what far they're going to use, it's, it, it has to be tested for a time. And you can see there's a difference between the usage of mobile over a difference between various countries here. Also, the speed of the internet is very important because you can use streaming and other things. It needs higher speed. So the average speed, you can see that uh, countries like United States have the highest, like 24 Mbps, whereas countries like India is uh, having very less, like 5.5 Mbps, 5.1, and China is uh, ahead, and Russia is also having 23. But Australia is comparatively having a lower Mbps rate or megabits per second. But in comparison, there are some countries which have surpassed the average, especially Japan is one country which is having 41.7 Mbps, 
and Singapore is having 61.0 Mbps. So these two nations, apart from Korea, which is not here, have a higher level of internet speed, and uh, 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 this, this makes them more, some, some of uh, the countries which have the fastest internet service, so that also will have some impact. Time spent of the internet, you can see that people from nations like Philippines, Thailand, Brazil, Vietnam, South Africa, UAE, they are using a longer time. Even Indians are, uh, are per five hours per, per day, they are using internet. But when it comes to uh, developed nations, the usage is comparatively uh, less. The times they spend online is comparatively less. And here comes the social media, which is very important. Uh, Facebook uh, is the most used by a lot of people. And then comes other uh, things like WhatsApp is uh, now acquired by Facebook uh, for 19 billion. It is one of the popular uh, app in India. So everybody is owning WhatsApp. But when I went to US, I found that uh, they, they are not hearing what is called as WhatsApp. They are having some other uh, kind of app for interacting with people, or they are uh, sending some messages with some other messenger, but not WhatsApp is not that popular. So uh, this uh, makes some important thing, even the new entrant like Viber is having 209 users. So what's happening in one internet minute? In one internet minute, 47,000 app downloads, $83,000 in sales, 3,000 photo uploads, 100,000 new tweets, 1.3 million video views. But what, as victimologist, our concern is something that I have highlighted in the red. 20 new victims of identity theft, 135 botnet infections. So that is what our concern. Our, even though the other concerns are very important because that is growth, but there is a concern for victimologists that it also creates a space for victimization. So with this, I will go to the victimological aspect of cyber crimes. The post-World War scenario, several types of crimes started occurring, but the growth of telecommunications in the 1960s is an ugly shoot, offshoot is cyber crimes. Even the founder of computer, Charles Babbage, did not know that it is going to happen because computers were secluded, but now computers are integrated with the communication technologies, and this integration has given birth to the internet and other tech related technologies, and this has also given birth to cyber crimes. There is no appropriate legal definition of cyber crimes. There were some academic definitions earlier it is an attack on the machine and computer assisted crimes. But slowly, the definitions of cyber crimes were changing. The US Department of Justice in 1989 defined those crimes where knowledge of computer system is essential to commit crimes. So imagine, in 1989, there is a component of knowledge essentiality is there, but now in 2015, there is no need for any knowledge of computers. Then, in 2000, it is harmful acts committed from or against computer or network. So here, these definitions show that the term cyber crime carries a connotation that any crime can be assisted with cyber assistance. That means, you add cyber with that, then it becomes cyber crime. So, slowly the definitions are changing over a period of time. But in the new millennium, in 2000s, that the, there is a great metamorphosis and a change of the definition, and that slowly the definitions changing from the machine to machine to the humans. The cyber crime is no more attack only on the machines. The convention of cyber crime in 2001, he touched upon the emotions of the human beings also very important. Apart from that, people losing money or their computer system is affected by virus. It is also the human being who is sitting up behind the computer is a very important person that he is the victim. So any usage of improper words also can construe to be cyber crimes. So this put to the end of the belief that everything is hacking or attack on e-commercial transaction. So it was in 2007, my cyber crime mentor, David Wall in University of Leeds, 
he expanded slightly the definition towards the victimization of human beings. So this is the metamorphosis or a period of nearly 25 years from machine to machine to direct human to human attacks. So in 2011, me and my wife, Dr. Devarati, we wrote a book, Cybercrime and Victimization of Women. And we specifically gave a definition of cybercrime from a victimization perspective, which is offenses that are committed against individuals or group of individuals with a criminal motive to intentionally harm the reputation of the victim or cause physical or mental harm to victim directly or indirectly using modern telecommunication networks such as internet, chat rooms, emails, notice boards, and groups, and mobile phones, SMS, MMS. So this definition is one of its first kind that sees a crime from a victimological perspective. Also, there is a myth on cyber victimization. If you search in Google, you will find cyber victimization is equal to cyber bullying or cyber stalking. Beyond that, people will not think what is cyber victimization. So how it is uh, common among the masses when people say cyber crime, oh, cyber crime, that is hacking. But cyber victimization, oh, that means it's cyber bullying. No, it's not that. Because victimization is a holistic aspect and it, has, it is the other side of the river that we have to see. It's like the other side of the coin. So I would like to break the myth of uh, this uh, um, <laughs> cyber victimization, especially among the scholars who are working in the area of cyber crimes. So I developed a new typology, and these four typology, cyber victimization of governments, corporate victimization, cyber victimization of individuals, and victimless crimes. The first one, cyber victimization of governments. So many of the governments are worried on attacks, cyber attacks, especially cyber terrorism, cyber warfare, internet use of terrorists. So I think if you all would have seen a movie on Die Hard 4, where a cyber terrorist will enter the critical infrastructures and also the planes and everything, and he will just smash everything. But is that going to happen is something that we have to wait and watch. But still, the vulnerability of those systems are there. Because insider threat is one important thing that is happening within the government and everywhere. People are afraid that certain things certain secrets may go to some other people and they may be attacked. And one such thing is hacktivism. These three people are very important people in the history of cyber crimes, whom last year there was a statue opening in Berlin. They are Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, and Julian Assange. So what these three people did? They leaked the secrets of the US government. So WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange and uh, Edward Snowden, he leaked the information. Also, Chelsea Manning, a former army soldier of the US, also leaked. So now Snowden is in the asylum of Russia. Julian Assange is with the asylum of Ecuador embassy in London. But Chelsea Manning is arrested and put in jail. Many people think that they are freedom fighters, they are revolutionaries, they are heroes. But governments are not thinking in that direction. Government thinks they are offenders. But government will not accept that they have become victim, but they are victims. There is one more government I found in a very peculiar way in Turkey, where I was there in May 2015, the government is attacked by trolls in Twitter and Facebook by several people. In fact, this government is something very peculiar, where the government is appointing a cyber army of 200 people to attack the trollers, which is highly unethical. But still, you, you have to attack a terrorist by in a terrorist mode. So that is what in Turkey they are doing. So that is very peculiar where the, they are called as AK party trolls. And these AK party trolls are the supporters of the government and they attack those people who are attacking the government. But still, governments are worried. So 
what specifically it's worried is that they are worried on their malware, phishing, data leakage, hacking, and spam. So especially data leakage is something that which most of the governments are worried because it, it, if it goes to wrong people, then many of the thing will come out. Surprisingly, a country like Russia has gone back to the older typewriters, leaving the computers so that their data will not be leaked. So this is an era that you can see a reversal change that the former older technology or older systems are better than the newer things because it allows for secrecy. Then comes the corporations or the businesses. So here also, the virus dissemination, hacking, denial of service, subordage, insider threat and insider abuse of net access. Cyber squatting is that somebody sitting on some of the website and asking for money if they want this particular site. Digital piracy, copyright infringement, intellectual property theft. So here, the businesses affected, where you can find that uh, there is a huge loss in businesses. Nearly this particular uh, data says that uh, 29,954, and then the key numbers is 135,000. And also you can see there are some attacks, me methods are hacking, denial of service, malware, social engineering, and physical attacks. So these threats, either by the technology, or by the employees, lack of funding, all these things, you can see there is a breach, security breach. So this security breach, is something important. Now cyber security itself is evolving as a bigger industry where a lot of people are getting employment because every system needs to be protected. Every infrastructure needs to be protected because security breaches has become very common. So, so here in case of businesses, you can find that cyber crimes, even though it's a global phenomena, when it comes to businesses, there are very few countries which are attacked, especially the top five countries, US and other uh, countries, they are, they are more attacked than the other countries. But significantly, these attacks are happening from their own places. Those attackers are not from outside, they are from their own countries. So this also you have to understand that there is an element of insider threat because not all systems are connected to the internet, not all things are internet. So there are some intranet systems and these intranet systems are vulnerable and those vulnerabilities are not created by outsiders, it's mostly created by the insiders. Then comes the last one of the victimization. It's interpersonal cybercrime victimization, property cybercrime victimization of individuals. So here, it is you, me, and other who can be victimized. So, so I would like to group it like dissemination of viruses, hacking, cracking of websites and emails, cyber harassment, bullying. So cyber harassment, I would put it holistically where Cyber bullying is a part, and cyber stalking or peer victimization a part. And also cyber hate or cyber racism, cyber grooming, this can be happen for children, women, and also men, child pornography, and virtual environments and victimization. Virtual environments are like uh, second life, where people use themselves as some avatars there, and they are victimized there, and they, some money is extracted. And then the property cybercrime victimization, it is identity-related cybercrime, identity theft and identity fraud, online scams, the one I was talking earlier about the professor, so that is a conference scam. So 419, especially that is the fraud of Nigerian penal code says 419, uh, that is advanced fee fraud, phishing, and also romance scams. A lot of romance scams is happening. People are lewd and sextortion is happening. Many of them are losing their money because of that. And also some of them are losing their content, especially if they write the blogs, articles, their plagiarism or stealing their content has become very normal in the internet and there is very few acknowledge the work of others. So in this case, the Norton Report 2013 makes it significant that the individuals, it made a research of 24 countries where uh, 431 million adults of 24 countries, where it found that 1 million plus victims a day, and every day there is a twice as many cybercrime victims as newborn babies. So 50,000 victims per hour, 820 victims per minute, and 14 victims every second. So this is more an individual victimization what Norton has done, the research on. 
So 69% of the adults have experienced cybercrime in their lifetime. Compared to 2010 survey, there has been a 3% rise in the overall cybercrime. And also cybercrime has affected 589 million people in just 24 countries, imagine. And 431 million <laughs> is the surge. So the last uh, one, though I won't uh, group it as uh, cyber victimization, but in another way it is victimless crime, what Edwin Scherr has defined as, where the element of component of victim contributing to the, their own victimization. Sexting is something that where an individual takes a photograph of himself or herself nude, send it to a partner. So this can be in wrong hands and then the person can be victimized. And the other one is revenge porn, now it's happening. So nowadays, relationships are very nebulous, unlike earlier times. So people are together, and after some times, they are not together. So some of them take their intimate moments as videos or photographs, and then they uh, keep it with themselves. But unfortunately, when the relationship is broken, then they put it on the internet or try to threaten, blackmail, and do whatnot. So this is one of the type, and then e-prostitution, Sex chat is something not new, it's very old. Internet addiction disorder, it is a emerging problem. Most of the countries are facing, so everybody is getting hooked to internet. Uh, so they are always in the internet, that is one thing. And then online pornography and online gambling. Online gambling is also emerging. Uh, like uh, countries like uh, Korea, several teens are uh, getting highly addicted to gambling. We have some case studies. Um, which uh, came to our Center for Cyber Victim Counseling and due permission was sought from the victims and then I'm using it here. So there is some Facebook impersonation happened for one victim where the offender impersonates the victim and creates a fake avatar. Fake avatar in the sense, a similar kind of uh, profile of the person and post abusive text. So people will believe that it is the victim who is acting in this kind of derogatory manner. And also another case is forced pornography, where the harasser posts personal information of the victim and posts pictures of compromising nature taken along with the victim in an adult website. People start calling the victim for sexual favor. And also trolling happened for many of the people. Now, there are the case of Shagarika Ghosh, Kavita Krishna, and all people. These people, these women are activists. These activists come online and they speak against the government or speak against uh, uh, certain Hindu groups or certain Muslim groups. Then they are put in peril. They are trolled, they are abused, they, they are told that they will be raped, they will be killed. So this uh, uh, kind of system is now existing. Slowly the patriarchy of the countries have also moved online because these people who are patriarchal in nature are only online. So feminist views are now hated and they are threatened. Fishing, mostly male victims interested to take risk and loses money to the tune of minimum $500 to maximum $10,000. One of our college professor came to me and told that he lost two lakh rupees uh, in a phishing scam like this. I asked that, why did you lose that money so easily? How? Because uh, he told that the offender sent a photograph, uh, a FedEx parcel photograph, stay with an arrow mark, your money is inside. So I believed that. Because there is a clear cut photograph and the person is telling your money is inside. So I believed. So this is the think that now it's happening, that people think that they can take some risk. If they take risk, they will get a big money. So this, this is what the offenders want, the victim to be greedy, and the victim can be easily lewd. And next is the insider threat, which uh, I was mentioning earlier about Julian Assange or Snowden or um, Chelsea Manning or any other person, the, those whistleblowers uh, or can happen uh, either as freedom fighter or heroes, but some, some can happen in a kind of a misuse way that where uh, this particular case where the perpetrator sends defamatory feedback email posting as HR department personnel to a company where the victim was delegated to the work. The email stated the victim is poor in which work which is not true. So this is an era that where you can easily defamed. So those were the times that defamation, it's very difficult. Like you, you need to put some notice and spread it to people, it's very tough. But here you can easily defame anybody, just put a Google Plus note or a Facebook note and spread the news that this person is not good, this person is bad. So defamation is the thing that it is possible very easily and this particular insider threat is the similar one. 
And purchase fraud is something that is happening in some countries because not all companies are really worth. There are some companies which has a reputation. If we sp spend money on that, the goods will come, come in a good condition. Even uh, it can be given back within 10 days and there is a guarantee. But there are companies which, uh, which appear to be good on the screen, but in reality, if you pay money, they will not give back the goods, neither the money. So this, this problem is also there. So what I have found over the period of uh, nearly six to eight years, is certain things that uh, very much evolving in this field is growth of victim turned offenders. So the victim is a one who sits in the computer, who is attacked by the perpetrator, but once that happens, he or she gets into revenge tone and tries to attack the offender by various means. So we developed a theory of victimization called as irrational coping theory. In this case where the victim has to cope in a normal situation uh, in a positive manner, can go to the police report or go to some other agencies which are assisting them. Instead, they hire a hacker and they collude with the hacker and they involve in activity which are more greater than the offender. So here, this also precipitates further crime. And another thing we found is that increase in the mobile phone victimization. As pointed earlier, like countries like India, where higher uses of mobile users are increasing now. So mobile is now no more just as phone, just you, it is again another computer. So, but in a smaller form. So now we can see more victimization can occur in mobile phones, where every apps is asking us, can I take your password? Can I take your this? Can you take your that? Everything we accept like a husband obliges the wife, yes. We'll never say no, we'll never read it, go what's happening inside, just blindly accept, because the app is available for free. And there is nothing like free in the internet. Everything free has a price, and the apps which are getting downloaded will take away all our information, is giving all information to the agency. So recently, the SCOTUS, or the Supreme Court of America, announced for <coughs> gay marriages as void. Immediately, Facebook announced there is a, like a rainbow, you can change your profile picture. So it, later we found that 26 million people changed their profile picture into the rainbow color, and this is used for research purpose. Imagine, that people who are supporting gays, who are supporting LGBTs, they want to check in. So that way around, anything if you are, uh, these corporates, especially Google or Facebook, are always having some kind of collision to take our data, because whenever you search in Google and come back to Facebook, you'll find that in the side scroll, what and all you have searched, it will come. For example, if you want to search like um, from South Africa to Perth, the flights, Immediately, when you come back to Facebook, you'll find that, that cheaper flights from Durban to Perth. So this will come. So how do they know? Because these, all these uh, computer giants or the software companies or the internet giants have some kind of collision that data, they make data more vulnerable. And there is nothing called as privacy in this modern world. So privacy is dead. Again, vulnerability of children and teens. Now, apart from the parents, the children, they use more internet, uh, even though Facebook says 13 and older, I have seen people who are in Facebook who are younger than that, even seven or eight or 10. They are, but they are claiming themselves to be 13. They are claiming themselves to be 14 or they are claiming more than that, but still they are younger children. So a lot of people, especially children, access more than the older people, and they are faster. They are more knowledgeable than the parents themselves. So the vulnerability of the children increases because they are now into online. But it, it, if it is appropriately supervised by the parents, the vulnerability may reduce. But now parents are also in to other kind of uh, <coughs> quagmire, so they, they don't care about the children. So then the vulnerability increases. 
Also, lack of reporting behavior. As told earlier the, about the case of the professor, that I'm a very much educated man, and how can I go and speak with a constable or a inspector to say that I'm victimized by such crime? How, what he will say immediately, are you educated? That's the first question he will ask. So that puts many of people problematic in this particular case of cybercrime victimization, where people will not report. They will be victim, but they will not like to report. So this lack of report behavior will increase further victimization. Also, there is a high unequal ratio of men and women victims. Both victims, men and women, are there. But what is happening to women, what is happening to men is totally different. So when it comes to women, it is more uh, personal, interpersonal victimization. When it comes to women, it is more property-related uh, victimization cases because men are more uh, risk takers, they are involving in fishing and other activity uh, victimization, but whereas women are targeted for sexual victimization and the impact is entirely different between men and women. Also, there is an increase of secondary victimization. As I told that even some goes to report, they are not treated with warmth by the criminal justice system. They are abused by the police, they are abused by the judiciary and uh, uh, so that, that slowly the reliance of cyber victims to certain NGOs are also happening in US, UK and other parts where people tend to go and open up themselves to some agency where they may not be mocked or ridiculed. So after establishing that this is a new form of victimization, I would like to quote the parable of Jesus. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. So cyber victimization is something unique than the physical space victimization. For reason, that proximity is one of the important things that you need to have for a physical space crime. But when it comes to cyber victimization, proximity is not a problem. So any person can victimize anyone from any part of the world. So that is that, that puts a different plane, different structure, and transnational and no boundaries. So also, if somebody wants to attack a person in a physical space, it requires a kind of a coordinates, a longitude and latitude, a space. So a place is very important, but in case of cyber crime, the place becomes irrelevant. And next, automated. So automatic, it, it, can, it can automatically victimize many people, uh, because once it is set, the program is set, the emails will be sent to several people. So all in small chunks. For example, a mail takes 15 pounds per, per account. So totally a big amount will go to the bank account of one person. And this 15 pound loss in a particular account will not be seen as a big deal at all. So this, this thing is happening where automated crime is something that which is new. And then, Professor Wall says that cybercrime requires systems and not knowledge. Earlier, you can find the definitions were basically relying on technological knowledge. If you want to hack some system, that people should be knowledgeable. Now, it is not a question of hacking alone. There are other systems. And internet is a place where you can learn anything. Internet teaches how to make bombs, how to hack. So all kinds of teachings are happening, but whether to take it appropriately. Some good things are also like that massive online open courses are there where you can learn many courses. But this is for good. But there are some uh, dark areas, dark avenues, where you can uh, get such teachings. Also, there are dark markets, stolen data markets, where you can go and buy online certain credit card details. So this problem is there. Uh, these are values in cyberspace or in ideas are not physical property. So we cannot touch and feel. but Ultimately, these ideas or the values will become the physical property. Once it comes to the bank and you can retrieve the money, it becomes the physical property. So what's happening with the legal situation is that many of the governments have started um, into creating laws because this is a uh, <coughs> victimization happening over the past 15 to 20 years. And the surge it happened, the laws cannot match. The laws were not able to match. The laws are slower in nature, so some of the countries have separate laws, but some of the countries are not having separate laws. 
So even countries like India, we have Information Technology Act, but that act is for e-commerce. It is not for cybercrime cyber and victimization. So what happened? Only certain sections, and they, are not, they don't know how to manage that. There are countries, only 82 countries, which ratified the European Union's Convention on Cybercrime, which has some kind of a holistic perspective on cybercrime, and it is international legislation. And it needs to be expanded more, because cyberspace is not a local space or regional space, it's an international space. Scholars like Peter Grabowski feels that cybercrime victimization or cybercrime is not something new, it's old wine in new bottle. Whereas Majit Yar, a professor at the University of Hull, a great cybercrime scholar, he feels that old wine in bottles of varying and fluid shape but he wrote an article, excellent article in 2005 in the European Journal of Criminology on routine activity theory, uh, how well it works with cyber crimes. And he, f he told very clearly that this will not fit cyber crimes because that the, co the composition of uh, cyber crime will not fit for reason that place is an important factor. The spatial component is very important. And here, uh, in the case of routine activities theory, it will not fit to cyber crime. But, he agreed that it is a new form of crime. My mentor, Professor Wall, new wine in no bottle. So he acknowledged that new wine, but he felt that there is no bottle. So here, I feel that cyber victimization is something new, and it should be given a new perspective, and it should be put in a new bottle. So in line with the critical victimology by Walklet and myself, I created a discipline or a perspective called cyber criminology in 2007. And my esteemed friend, Natty Ronald, created a new perspective called positive victimology that where the victims can come out of their victimization by positive methods. So I would like to introduce a new perspective in a way that it is critical, cyber victimology. And I define it as the study of forms of online victimization, its impact on victims, and responses of society and systems. So with it, I would like to give some concluding thoughts. Cyberspace is a colonized space. Unfortunately, it is colonized by a very big nation called United States of America. So the laws are American, the usage, everything is American. So the First Amendment guarantee, free speech is there. If it comes to in conflict with certain other nations, nothing can be done. So if you are victimized, according to your culture, you cannot go and report to Google, you cannot go and report to Facebook, then they will very calmly say that it will not fit our laws. So the insensitive nature of these giants who work according to the American laws will not look into issues which may happen in other countries. Because so this is a problem, but Decolonization of cyberspace is a really challenge where recently the United Nations proposed for this, to have cyberspace under their control, but unfortunately that United States did not agree. And also there are other nations which want to control this cyberspace, for example, like China, Pakistan, Iraq, where undemocratic practices are there. So they don't want such kind of uh, control to go out of their hands. So here there is a dual situation where extreme freedom of speech is there, where in another situation there is no freedom of speech at all. Lawmakers, they have to think, especially the politicians, to create laws which are correct and which are highly useful and which cannot be going beyond their limitations. For example, in recently the Supreme Court of India struck down one particular section of the Information Technology Act called as 66A, which gives a broader aspect of hate speech and other activity online. Once a politician was, politician died in Mumbai and two girls, they put a Facebook status, this is at another day, and another girl liked it. Both were arrested for creating hate speech online. So this was the situation and then one another law student fought in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court struck down this particular section as unconstitutional. So this is happening in many of the countries, not only in India, for reason, the politicians are not that much aware 
uh, that the situation in the ground reality of especially cyber crimes, you, you have to be very careful in creating such definitions or such laws. So now the 66A has gone in India, so now everybody is free to cyber bully others, harass others, and there is no law. So now, if they are striking something, the law should be repealed. That is not happening. So this is the situation in many countries we have to see. Policing, again, as I pointed, the law, law is not in phase with the, with the cyber crimes victimization. The police are also not in phase. Any new technology is an anathema to the police. They are policing with conventional methods, very easy for them. Uh, but now you are trying to make them cyber technocrats. So either they have to bring in some technocrats or they themselves have to become technocrats. That's a very difficult situation for policing. Many of the police in less developed nations would not like others to intrude into their business. But there are some other uh, developed nations. They hire some cyber security experts. Even uh, US have hired certain former cyber offenders like Kevin Mitnick to involve in cyber security activities. So that is a situation in a different nations, but still it is a long way to go to police such a situation. And judiciary, judiciary has to get the training of this. See, this is question not only on technology. Technology is only a small part. The other part is more human. That's the problem. Many of them think that cybercrime is more technology, so I may not understand. It is not the case. It is only a small part in case of investigation where it can be given to some agency uh, uh, where they are interested. So if, they, if you get the evidence from them, then later on it is the judges who are well trained in that particular aspect. They can work on it. Also, these internet service providers, they should be very sensitive to the needs of the victims. Uh, currently, it is very difficult even for us to write to Facebook or Google to ask them to remove uh, certain unwanted uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, write-ups in the net. Many times we have succeeded, but sometimes they say that, no, it doesn't come under our laws. So that is a problem. ISPs who are sitting in US should be more sensitive to the needs of the other countries where the culture is entirely different. Also, media is outblowing certain cyber crimes out of proportion. So that is also should not be done because it is now an emerging form of crime. We, have, we are acknowledging a new form of crime, but not to the extent that you can threaten people. So certain things are happening, but media is highlighting again and again certain things, try to terrorize people. So that is also a problem. Another thing, the victims. Victims, you, me, and everybody. So the very certain person other than the offender who is not a known, but the victim is very certain. So we should be very careful online. Whenever we go online, it is similarly like when you go outside. Are, are we trying to open our buses in crowded buses? No. Same case, in case of uh, online, why we have to open up everything? So why we be, become very lighter? Why we tell everything to an unknown person in Facebook or in Twitter? So these victims also should be a little more careful. I'm not blaming the victim, but still the carefulness should be there. And NGOs and society who are conscious should come forward to help such victims. It is not the question here, these NGOs or uh, societies, civil societies need to have a knowledge in cybercrime. Rather, they can be conventional victim provide service providers, but can be more sensitive or can be more empathetic with the victims of cybercrimes. Thank you for your patience listening. Thank you very much.